Hey everyone, it's me, Mr. Spinelli. Today we're going to fly through some cal. I might make some mistakes, uh, but I will correct them if I spot them. Otherwise, check out the comments below. Uh, first thing we're going to do is take the derivative of some integrals. So this is Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 2, depending on what textbook you use. So everywhere we see a t in the integrand, let's call this function f of t, our derivative will be f of b times the derivative of b minus f of a times the derivative of a, where this is our b, the upper limit, and a is our lower limit. So for this particular problem, we see t being squared. So we're going to square the 3x squared, our upper limit, and subtract 1. That is the f of b. That gets multiplied by the derivative of b. Derivative of 3x squared is 6x. We then subtract. Now we replace t with tangent of x. We square that and subtract 1. All of that is f of a. It needs to be multiplied by the derivative of tangent of x, which is secant squared of x. After this, it's just a bunch of algebra. So we get 9x to the 4th minus 1, all times cx. Just be sure to distribute that through. Minus tangent squared of x minus 1, all times secant squared of x. So again, be sure to distribute that. And don't forget about this pesky negative to distribute. Um, again, make sure you square the 3 to get the 9, and you square the x squared to get the x to the 4th. Next one, we'll go through even quicker. dy dx equals everywhere we see a t, we replace it with the upper limit, e to the x squared. Minus sine of t, we replace with e to the x squared. Minus e to the x squared cubed. All of this is multiplied by e to the x squared's derivative, which is, copy it down, e to the x squared times the derivative of the exponent 2x. So that's our f of b times b prime. We will then subtract. Now we replace cosine of t, all the t's, with ln of x minus sine of natural log of x and minus natural log of x cubed. Carefully, all of that needs to be multiplied by the derivative of natural log of x, which is 1 over x. Again, now it's a distribution problem and simplifying, but these are intentionally messy, so no need to really simplify for this sake. Here is more basic one. This is something you're more likely to see. Um, some more follow-up questions, which I'll show you um, in some examples to come. So again, replace t with the upper limit. Uh, if you're good at these, you know that I'm wasting my time right now because the derivative of a constant is 0. So this entire term will go to 0. And we subtract. Now we replace t with 2x e to the 2x times the derivative of 2x, which is 2. So I am going to simplify this one for the sake of things. This would be negative 4x e to the 2x. So that would be y prime. Um, you may end up seeing problems where you have to find y double prime. Um, so just keep in mind that that would require chain rule, or sorry, product rule and chain rule technically. Um, you'd have negative 4 e to the 2x plus a negative 4x times 2 e to the 2x, and of course simplify. So there's a nice little warm-up. Now here's the real deal. So picture below is f of x. So again, I'm going to note this function is f of x. And we get this definition for g of x. Okay, And that g of x is valid for x being on the interval negative 8 to 8, which is the same as f of x. So it's an integral from 2 to x. Um, so problem 0, as I call it, is to literally find the first and second derivative. Um, if you follow along from above, you should notice this one's really easy. Uh, g prime of x is literally just f of x, because it would be f of x times 1 minus f of 2 times 0, because the derivative of 2 is 0. So you clean it up, you just get, well, g prime is f. And then taking the derivative of these two equations, g prime being f, sorry, that's one equation, you get g double prime of x is equal to f prime of x. Hey, Nick, how you doing? All right, so we're going to use all of this to help us answer these questions. Um, so again, remember the integral is going from 2 to x. So I'm going to first find a whole bunch of areas. Okay, so here we've got a triangle of height 4, width 4. So that's 4 times 4 is 16, divided by 2 is 8. Uh, this area here is exactly the same. It is also 8. 
Um, down here, I'm going to use some red. This is an area of two. This triangle is an area of two. Um, here in the middle, this piece and this piece going to be a little bit tricky. So it's a quarter circle, one fourth pi r squared of radius two. Okay, so um, this area is pi that I just erased. Okay, but the whole square is four. So 4 minus pi uh, will give me this area here. So 4 minus pi. So it's you know just a little bit smaller than 1. Um, and this area would also be 4 minus pi. Okay, So that should help me answer some of the questions that are going to come up. So the first one says, compute g of 4. So g of 4, if you recall, is the integral of f from 2 to 4. Um, again, we're replacing x, this upper limit, uh, with 4. So if we go from 2 to 4, we find that there's an, um, and again, this is f of x dx. I'm going to stop writing that eventually. Um, so when I go from 2 to 4, I'm going to take this negative 2, and that's it, because that gets me from 2 to 4. Um, so that's all I got to do. So that's a negative 2 because it's below the x-axis. Um, g of 8, I guess I will keep writing this, is the integral from 2 all the way to 8 of f of x dx. Um, so if I go from 2 to 8, I've got the negative 2 below the x-axis, and then I've got the positive 8 because the area of the triangle is above the x-axis. So that's a total of 6. So g of 8 is 6. Next up, it wants g of 0. Um, so that, I'm going to shorthand this, is the integral from 2 to 0, which is actually the negative integral uh, from 0 to 2 if I want to switch the order. Um, and I like to switch the order because when I do this integral, I get negative, and since that area is below the x-axis, um, it's negative 4 minus pi. Okay, so I end up with actually just 4 minus pi. Um, so that area is below the x-axis, and we said that 4 minus pi is a little bit less than 1. Um, so my initial thought is, oh, well, my answer is just negative, let's call it, just less than 1, so negative 0.9 we'll call it. Um, but since I'm going to the left, I'm going from 2 to 0. Since I'm going in the, the wrong direction, if you will, um, that's why I will get a different result. Um, makes it the opposite sign. So again, this was 4 minus pi, and this was 2. Didn't mean to erase that. G of negative 2, um, again, this is the same story. We're going from 2 to negative 2, but I really want to do the correct way because I don't want to mess up my negatives. Um, so if I go from negative 2 to 2, I've got a 4 minus pi and a 4 minus pi, so that's really 8 minus 2 pi. Um, and again, it's negative, so negative 8 minus 2 pi, but it's a negative negative, so it's really positive. Because again, I'm going to the left, so all my convention is backwards. Go into negative 4, well, I can actually just take my result from knowing that at negative 2, at negative 2, we just did that one, it was 8 minus 2 pi. So if I keep going left from here to here, I'm going to subtract another negative 2. So I'll actually add 2. And so this result will be 10 minus 2 pi. Um, and then finally, using that same logic, now that I'm at negative 4 and I want to go this way, um, instead of adding 8 because it's above the x-axis, I'm going to subtract 8 because I'm going again the wrong direction. So if I subtract 8, I get 2 minus 2 pi. So again, I subtracted 8 to get here, and I added, I actually subtracted a negative 2, or added 2, to go from there to there. So all of those were just integrals. And again, why did I do areas? Because I had a picture of f, um, g prime, sorry, g of x is this integral up here. Um, so I needed to actually compute the area between x equals 2 and whatever value I wanted to compute g of x at. The next ones we should really fly through. Um, g prime of negative 6 is really just f of negative 6. So I'll do just this one for the sake of argument. So I come up here, f of negative 6 is 2. I'm just finding the y value. Um, so all of these are boring. This is just the y value. y value at x equals negative 2. That actually took me longer to write out than it would be to find it. The next ones are all derivatives, so let's switch to pink. So now g double prime, we said, was f prime. Okay, so that means I need to go up to my graph, and I need to find f prime. Well, this is a graph of f, 
how do I get f prime from a graph of f? I look at the slope. So then the slope here at negative 6, well, it's just down 1 over 1. So negative 1 over 1 is a slope of 1 negative, of course. g prime of 0, I go here. That's at the top of the semicircle. That's a slope of 0. g double, g double prime of 2 is really f prime of 2. So I go to 2. Ah, this is the interesting one. Uh, from the left, I have technically a vertical tangency, a negative vertical tangency. It's going down here. Um, and then from the right, I have a positive slope of 1. So the, the left and right-sided limits of those derivatives uh, would be does not exist because the left and right are different. Uh, g double prime of 4, again, reminder, this is f prime of 4. Um, and then here, we've got a slope of up 1 over 1 again. So that'll be 1. Uh, check the link below. You should be able to access these. All right. I forgot to change this. Oh, no, it's the same problem. Okay, so continuing. Now it's on what intervals is g of x increasing, decreasing, concave up, yada, yada, yada. So I'm going to write in pink a reminder. Remember, this is f of x, and we know that g prime is equal to f, and g double prime is equal to f prime. So that should help us answer every single question that is on this number 13. When is g of x increasing? We know a function is increasing when its derivative, g prime in this case, is greater than 0. Well, when is g prime greater than 0? g prime is precisely f, so whenever f is greater than 0. So whenever this thing is above the x-axis. Okay, so that'd be from negative 8 to negative 4, and from 4 to 8. When is this thing decreasing? Well, the exact same logic g double prime less than 0, which is when f is less than 0. So that'd be from negative 4 to 0, and 0 to 4. And I know some people will combine these two, and I don't care. You can have that conversation with your teacher. Uh, the next one, concave up. Concave up means the second derivative is positive, which in this case means the first derivative, f prime, is positive. How do I get f prime looking at this graph of f? Well, I look at the slope. So when is this thing increasing? Well, it's increasing on this interval and this interval. And I'll just leave that. You can write the interval notation. And then finally, when is it concave down? Well, it's concave down when the second derivative is negative, which in our case is when f prime is negative, which is when this function is decreasing, going down. And again, I'll let you do the interval notation for that. Where does g of x have a local or relative max, min, etc., etc.? What color haven't we used? Gray. So where do I have max and min? Uh, remember, this, since this is f, it's really a graph of the derivative of g. All right, so um, it gives us a lot of information. Relative max. Maxes happen when our derivative changes from positive to negative. So this would be a local max at x equals negative 4. We would have a local min changing from negative to positive. Be sure to include that justification as you write out your answer. I didn't write, you know, explain. But you know to explain using what you know about a function and its derivatives. Um, at x equals 0, it's neither a max nor min because it goes from decreasing to decreasing. So that would be something that, uh, you know, looks like negative x cubed would be an example of that. At this point, you have a uh, horizontal tangency, um, but it goes from decreasing to decreasing, so it's neither a max nor a min. Uh, what else is interesting? Point of inflection. Point of inflection, those are going to be at x equals negative 2, 0, and x equals 2. Why is that? Well, if you look at my coloring, it's where green becomes blue or blue becomes green. Well, what are those cases? That's where the concavity is changing. So we get points of inflection when we're looking at a graph of the derivative g prime of x. So when we're looking at a graph of the derivative, points of inflection happen at local max and min of the derivative function, which again are where my concavity is changing. My green becomes blue. That means I'm going from concave down to concave up. That is precisely a point of inflection. x equals negative 2. x equals 0. I'm changing from concave up to concave down. Precisely the definition of point of inflection. Um, so just to reiterate, we had relative max and min at x equals negative 4 and x equals 4, respectively. And then these were negative 2, 0, and 2. 
because um, the next question is very important. What are the absolute extrema of g of x on this interval? The main thing you need to compute, you need to compute g of your endpoints. Do not forget your endpoints and your critical points. These are the musts. What are critical points? Friendly reminder. Critical points, that is where your derivative, in this case g, your derivative is either 0 or does not exist. Okay, so for us the critical points are these. These are our critical points. Okay, so we're going to compute g of negative 8. g of 8, those are the endpoints. We're going to compute g of negative 4 and g of 4. Oh, but wait, I think we already did that because I think I was nice and had you already do that. So you would simply look at these, those are, that's a critical point and an endpoint, and these, critical point and endpoint. Find the one that is the smallest. Find the one that is the biggest. That's all you got to do. So I'm going to leave that at that. Um, it's that easy, especially when the problems are tailored to help you. Now, what did I do? I gave you the exact same function. I called this function f of x. It's the exact same picture, but what did I change? Now g of x is only valid on the interval negative 4 to 4, and I changed this upper limit of integration. What does that do? It changes precisely the most important step, your g prime and g double prime. So when you compute these using fundamental theorem of calculus part 2, which we covered on the first three questions, g prime of x will be f of 2x times 2. And then, of course, there's the minus f of 2 times 0 because the derivative of 2 is 0. So you ultimately end up with g prime of x is equal to twice f of 2x. Okay, so what that does is it causes a shrink. If you were to, I'll just graph f of 2x, um, that would pull everything in as follows. So it would look nice and shrunken this way. It gets kind of tighter fit, and I didn't draw it perfectly, but that's what it would really look like. Um, so if you're curious more on that, look up horizontal stretching and shrinking. Not everybody covers these things. Okay, so again, fundamental theorem of calculus gave us g prime was twice f of 2x. g double prime from chain rule will be 2 f prime of 2x times 2, so it becomes 4 f prime of 2x. So review your chain rule. So this is really your Rosetta Stone. This helps you answer every single question. Um, g of 1 g of 1 is really equal to g of 2 from the last page because it's the integral from 2 to 2 times 1 uh, which is 2. Oh, but this is different. Uh, g of 2 is an integral of itself. So you go from 2 to 2, that's going to be 0. This next one is an integral from 2 to 4 times 2, so it really goes to 8. Um, so I'll refer you to the previous areas, right? This was a negative 2 and this was a positive 8, so that one would be equal to 6. Um, so I'm not going to really bore you with all of these ones because I chose the values so that they're basically the same as the last problems. But again, just remember to double that, that number up top. Okay, this 1 became a 2, this 4 became an 8, 0 will stay 0. This negative 1, this negative 2, this negative 4, those will all double. So 2 to negative 2, 2 to negative 4, 2 to negative 8. So again, you already computed all of these integrals on the previous uh, page, to go two pages back. Um, then the main thing, g prime of negative 3, based on my definition, that's 2f of 2 times negative 3, which is negative 6. So now I go to f of negative 6, well that's 2, so 2 times 2 gives me 4. Uh, g prime of 2 is really 2 f of, 2 times 2 is 4, so it's really f of 4. f of 4 is 0. So I get 2 times 0 is 0. Uh, continuing on, this one's going to be the second derivative. So now it's 4f prime of negative 6. So I go to negative 6. Well, that's where I had a slope of negative 1. So I get 4 times that is negative 4. Uh, g double prime of 0 is 4 times f prime of 0. Sorry, that should say 4 times f prime of 0. Because 0 times 2 is still 0. Um, f prime of 0, that's where we had the horizontal tangency, so that's a big old zero. G double prime of one, that's four times f prime of two, because we double that one. 
Uh, two was that spot where we were undefined or did not exist, whatever way you want to call that. Ask your teacher what they prefer. G double prime of 2 is really 4 times F prime of 2 times 2 is 4. So we go to x equals 4, and that's where we have a slope of 1. So 4 times 1 gives me 4. So those ones you should be able to really fly through. That's not my eraser. Um, I guess I don't have to keep erasing that. Because now we go to the next questions. And this is where it's basically the same story. Um, but everything just gets divided by 2. And why does it get divided by 2? Because things are doubled, which, as you saw when I sketched that little uh, very crude sketch of what this would look like as f of, right? This is your f of x. This is f of 2x. Um, you would think it would get wider, but it actually gets shorter because when x is negative 4, I look at what the result was when it's 8 because negative 4 times 2 gives me negative 8, so that's why I use the y value from over there. Um, so everything's shrunken down. Um, and if you actually use this graph that I've now made, which now we can't see, there it is, I'm erasing it, bye, it's gone. Um, when is it increasing or decreasing? Um, so you should actually really, that answers all your questions. Use this graph that I'm making with the red highlighter. Um, so when is it increasing? When it's above the x-axis, um, that thing should cross through at negative 2. So I should probably make this sketch a little bit more accurate. So it should cross through at negative 2. Eraser, the uh, highlighter never likes me. So when is it increasing when it's above the x-axis, right? It being g prime being positive, which is really when f prime of 2x is positive. I know I left out the 2 that's in front here. Um, it's kind of not important because 2 times a positive number is still positive. Um, so that's going to be from negative 4 to negative 2 and 2 to 4. Uh, when is it decreasing? Well, it's decreasing uh, when g prime is less than 0, which is really when f prime of 2x, sorry, not f prime, these should all say f. That should say f, so let's just get rid of half of it. Uh, so when f of 2x is less than 0, so that's from negative 2 to 0, union 0 to 2. And again, your teacher may combine those into one interval, whatever you want to do. Float your own boat. Concave up, well, that's when the second derivative is positive, which is really when f prime of 2x is positive. So again, remember, this is the graph of f of 2x. Um, now again, there's really a 4 out in front, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so when is this thing increasing? It's increasing from negative 1 to 0 and 1 to 4. And then finally we'll go purple. Concave down is when the second derivative is less than 0, which is really when f prime of 2x is less than 0, um, which is when the slope is decreasing. So that's from negative 4 to negative 1 and 0 to 1. Cool beans. Uh, where do we have lo local relative max and min? Again, everything just got divided by 2, essentially. So your max is at x equals negative 2 instead of x equals negative 4. Your min is at x equals 2. Again, this one's going positive to negative for a max, negative to positive uh, for a min. Points of inflection have also been divided by 2, so those are going to happen at x equals negative 1, 0, and 1 down here, up here, and down there. So these are your points of inflection. These are your min and max, or max and min, respectively. Uh, then finally, absolute extrema. Again, be sure to check endpoints, which now are these guys. And I had you compute those on the previous page, even though we glossed over them. And then also check your critical points. Uh, critical points. So you would compute g of those. Now, sometimes AP likes to leave one out on the previous parts so you will have to do one of your more one more of your integrals and that was the integral from 2 to 2x right of f of t dt remember that was our definition of g of x so sometimes they make you do one more integral just depends on how nice they're feeling all right totally shifting gears now we're going to find the area between curves thanks for sticking around if you've been with us for the first 24 and a half minutes area between curves what's the gist here you know take a square cut out a circle. How do you find the area? Well, you find the area of the square, and then you minus the area of the circle, right? Same idea here. Uh, you got some function, let's call it f of x, 
and it's above g of x. So how do you find the area between curves? Well, you find the area under f by integrating from, let's say, a to b. And then you go ahead and integrate g of x from a to b, and you get this area. Well, what happens when you do the area of f minus the area of g? Well, you're left with the area that you want, which is right here. Super. So what do you do? You do the integral of the top minus the bottom. Uh, what happens if you have a function where you have a right and a left? Well, then you have some function of uh, y and some function g of y. And so then when you do the area, you're going to do the area from some uh, upper and lower and upper, as I mark them in order, uh, y values. And you'll do the same thing. Find the area of the right function and subtract the area of the function on the left. And you get the area between them. So basically, it's right minus left, or top minus bottom. It gives you the area between curves. Step number one is to find the intersections. How do we find intersections? Find the intersections. That is step number one all the time. You set the two functions equal to each other. So x squared equal to root x. Um, there's a few ways to do these. Let's do it the crazy hard way. Or not the crazy hard way, but just the, maybe the uglier way. Uh, subtract square root of x from both sides, and you get x squared minus x to the one half. Factor out x to the one half. There are certainly several ways to find this. And you get this. Now you set each of these factors equal to zero. So if you set x to the one half equal to zero, square both sides, whatever you want, you get x equals zero for your first, first intersection. Next one, you add one to both sides, so then you get x to the three halves equals one, and then you raise both sides to the two thirds. One to the two thirds is one. So there's the intersection of these two functions. Now you may be wondering which one's on top, which one's on bottom. Well, square root of x looks like this, x squared looks like this. So here's x squared, here's square root of x, just part of it. And again, they are intersecting at x equals zero and one. Uh, let's say you didn't know who was on top or who was on bottom. Let's pretend I don't even know. I'm going to think x squared's on bottom, or on top. So I'm going to integrate from zero to one of the top minus the bottom. Again, I'm doing this wrong on purpose. And so when I integrate, I get one-third x cubed minus, but this is really x to the one-half, so I add one to the exponent, I get three-halves, so I get two-thirds x to the three-halves. Hopefully you're good at this by now. And then I plug in one, subtract what I get when I plug in zero. Plug it in one, I get one-third times one cubed minus two-thirds times one to the three-halves. I'm just writing this a long way. And then I'm going to subtract what I get when I plug in zero, which will just be a big old fat zero minus zero. And so what do I get? I really get one-third minus two-thirds. One-third minus two-thirds. Well, that's negative one-third. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've never seen uh, a ruler measure negatively, so area won't be negative. So what do I really do? Oh, I messed up top and bottom. So I would swap these, and that would get rid of the negative, and now this is no longer e equal, so ignore that. And my answer is just a positive one-third. So if you mess up top and bottom, no big deal. Own your mistake and just say, hey, I swapped top and bottom. I know area shouldn't be negative. Sweet, you know what you're talking about. All right, next one, y equals 2x squared plus 10. I know I want to find the intersection, so I'm going to be setting these two equations equal to each other. All right, this is annoying. I'm going to do a division by 2 first of all, because those numbers just look too big for my brain at 9 o'clock on a Tuesday. By the way, March 22nd, not January 9th. My iPad is lying to you. Uh, move everything to the same side. x squared minus 2x minus 3 set equal to 0. Can I solve this by factoring? Looks like it's going to be a minus 3 plus 1. Let's double check. Plug in 3. 3 squared is 9 times 2 is 18. 18 plus 10 is 28. 4 times 3 is 12 plus 16 is 28. I feel good about these answers. So I get x equals negative 1 and 3 when I set each of these factors equal to 0. I'm going to erase that word because you should be able to do that in your sleep. Um, so again, who's top and who's bottom? You know, Well, let's do it another way. Here's negative 1 on a number line. Here's 3 on a number line. Pick a nice number in between them. Mm, pick your favorite. I like 0. Plug 0 into both of these. y equals 2x squared plus 10. Well, I just get 10. y equals 4x plus 16. 4 times 0 plus 16 is 16. So who's on top? Clearly the 4x plus 16. So 4x plus 16. I'm going to integrate from negative 1 to 3, my intersection points. 
minus the lower equation, 2x squared plus 10. Notice I put parentheses around the 2x squared plus 10 because I don't want to mess up distribution. When I do this, I get 4x plus 16 minus 2x squared minus 10. So I'm going to show some of these steps. I get 4x minus 2x squared plus 6. Uh, did I do that right? Yes, I did. Looks good. All right, so I'm going to be integrating this from negative 1 to 3. Um, I might stop here because you can really type this in on Desmos. Uh, trust Desmos over me. 2x squared minus 2 thirds x cubed plus 6x. I'm going to plug in 3, subtract when I get my plug in negative 1. Plug in 3, 3 squared is 9, 9 times 2 is 18. 3 cubed over 3 is really 3 squared. 3 squared times 2 is 18. And I get a plus 18. That's a whole lot of that. Now plug in negative 1. Well, I square negative 1, it stays positive, so I get 2. Negative 1 cubed uh, stays negative, so negative times negative 2 thirds is positive 2 thirds. And then I finally have minus 6. I don't really care what this is. I care if you understand what we did. We did top minus bottom. We found the intersection points for our limits of integration. And then we did a whole bunch of what I would say boring calculus. I hate to say it. I love calculus. That's boring. All right, find the area between these curves. Ooh, red flag here. I got an X and a Y. So just so you know, something weird's happening here. Um, which one can we do, right? Some of these you might have been wondering, well, can you do it, integrate the other way? Uh, let's do a very crude sketch of this one. 2X squared plus 10. It's a parabola. Y equals 4X plus 16 looks like that. Um, this one you have a clear top and bottom. If you draw lines like this, um, you're always hitting the same function on top, same function on bottom. That's a clear winner for integration with respect to x. Um, if you draw lines this way, I'm going to put a dashed line here for a reason. Um, up here, you've got a clear left and right. That says R, believe it or not. Uh, down here, maybe I'll switch colors. Down here, the same function is on the left and the right. So that one would not be fun to do with respect to y. Sad face with a tear. Um, up here, you have a clear top and bottom. You also have a very clear left function and right function. Notice I'm hitting the same function on the left, the root x, and the same function on the right. If you wanted to do this one again, uh, plug 0 and 1 to both these equations, you get y equals 0 and 1 for the intersections. Um, so if you integrate from 0 to 1 of the right function, which is y equals x squared, solve that for x, you get x equals plus or minus root y, but you're going to take the positive root because you've got the right side of it. So that would be your top or right function. And then if you subtract, well, you've got to solve y equals the square root of x, you get x equals y squared. Um, if we do this one, which let's do it real quick, um, you should be able to see that it's actually the same exact answer. Um, these two things are the same, minus the order. right? Change y's to x's and they're the same thing. But remember, I purposely messed up the order. So clearly the integration with respect to x or y gives you the same exact result. Sometimes you have that option. Um, sometimes you're forced, not necessarily forced, but it's going to be easier to do one way or the other. Since this first function is a parabola that opens up to the right, I'm going to want to switch the other one to be x as a function of y. Um, and that's because to write this equation, y as a function of x, I'd have to have two pieces. I'd have to have um, the top half and the bottom half of that parabola, and that's not going to be fun. So back to where we normally start, we set the two functions equal to each other. Um, I'm going to double everything because, you know, I don't know. That now it's 9.09 on a Tuesday. I don't want to deal with fractions right now. Not that I'm afraid of fractions, just I'm old. So move everything to the same side, and we get this. Uh, y squared minus 2y minus 8. Hopefully I'm not making a mistake. Um, so I'm thinking y minus 4 and y plus 2 sounds good. Those multiply to make a negative 8 and add to make a negative 2. So I get y equals negative 2 and 4 for my intersections. Let's actually save this, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Um, maybe, again, I don't want to figure out who's on the right and left. So again, take my intersections, which maybe I should draw this way. 
right? Negative two is my lower y value, four is my upper bound for my y's. I'm gonna pick a number in between there. I'm gonna pick y equals zero. If I plug that into the first one, well, I get negative three. Plug it into the next one, I get negative one. Who's further to the right? Well, the x minus one. Oops, I messed up, forgive me. Gotta plug it in here, I get one, right? Plug in zero for my y, I get one. Still further to the right, but oops, that could have been a big mistake. Okay, so y plus one is on the right, and the one half y squared minus three is on the left, so I'm gonna integrate from negative two to four of this function. Uh, so I'm gonna pretty much stop here, but I wanna point something out. When I do this subtraction, I get y, I'm gonna have plus four, because so, I can do one plus the three, minus the negative three, and then I'm gonna have minus one half y squared. So what do I wanna point out here? I wanna point out that this is essentially the same thing as this, minus the signs. And of course, the fact that I doubled what's um, over here. I doubled everything here. If I divided all that by two, I'd have one half y squared, uh, minus y, oops, not, uh, minus 4. So change the sign on that, negative 1 half y squared plus y plus 4. Do you see that now that's the same exact thing? Um, so if you don't do any divide by 2 or anything crazy before you solve for your intersections, you'll see that that'll be your integrand. You know, maybe the signs are changed because you moved different things to the left or the right, so you changed who was on top or bottom or left or right um, so you, if you integrated you know what you get when you write everything equal to zero um, you might just get a negative answer and that's okay um, so then we integrate that and that's boring so I'll leave that to you next one y equals x and y equals x cubed so again this is naturally set up to uh, do integration with respect to x so set these equal to each other x equals x cubed common mistake is to divide by x and you lose one of your zeros being x equals zero um, so I'm going to subtract the x to the other side. This is my preferred method because then I don't lose any zeros. And then I get x squared minus 1 when I factor in x. So I get three intersection points. I get x equals 0, 1, and negative 1. Uh, not written in any order. Um, so if you want to figure out who's on top, pick a number between 0 and 1. Pick a number between 1 and negative 1, um, which would be negative half and a half respectively. Um, and you'll actually see that it changes who's on top and who's on bottom. x cubed looks something like that, not perfect. y equals x looks something like that. So for the first interval, going from negative 1 to 1, we have that x cubed is on top. Again, you can find that however you want. Uh, going from, oops, not, that should say from negative 1 to 0. I think that's what I said. I wrote something different. From 0 to 1, we've got x on top. So again, kind of going back to this previous one, see how when you set them equal to each other, it kind of just depends on which order you get for who's first or who's second. You might mess it up. Um, just so you know, if you want to type this one in your calculator to just do a quick check of the answer, do the integral from all the way to the left where they first intersect at negative 1 to all the way at the right at 1. So again, this was x equals negative 1, 0, and 1. If you go from negative 1 all the way to 1 and you do take your choice, take your pick, if you do this in your calculator, you will get the answer with only one integral instead of two. So what would we have to do? Well, we should switch colors to get away from pink for a bit. You get one-fourth x to the fourth minus one-half x squared. This part is evaluated from x equals negative one to zero. Plus, then we'd have one-half x squared minus one-fourth x to the fourth. This part is from x equals zero to one. So for this first one, I plug in 0, I get a big fat 0, plug in negative 1. Well, if I'm raising it to even power, it'll stay uh, positive, so I get 1 fourth minus a half. And then over here, plug in 1, I get 1 half minus a fourth, subtract what I get when I plug in 0. So again, this is the first integral, this is the second integral separated by brackets. So a fourth minus a half is really a fourth minus two fourths. Um, which is a negative fourth, but then there's this negative here to distribute, so I get a fourth. Half minus a fourth is two fourths minus a fourth, which is a fourth. Add these two fourths together, and I get a half. And I move on with my life, and hopefully you check that with Desmos and verify that I did it right. So now what do we need to do? We need to take these regions and start revolving them. 
and see that this is so very much similar to what we just did with area, the whole idea of top minus bottom and things like that. Um, so we're going to take the area in the first octant, so x cubed and x, um, I got the wrong guy on top, x cubed looks something like that, x looks something like that, so here's x, x cubed. Let's just make sure my picture looks good. Oh, is that how I drew it? Yep, that looks good. Okay, and I'm actually going to... I got Desmos pulled up here, and I should be using it. Because uh, Desmos is invaluable. Yep, X is on top just to verify that my brain is still working. So we're going to call this region T. And we're going to revolve it around the X axis. Alright, time to introduce some new colors. Let's go with green. So here's the X axis. I like to rewrite this x-axis. I like to write y equals 0. So I'm going to revolve that around y equals 0. So that touches right down here at the first intersection point of x equals 0. And the other intersection point of x equals 1 is up here. So what we're going to notice is we have a top function. Still the same idea. We have a top function. Uh, we want to know its distance to the axis of rotation that we're revolving around. That distance I'm going to call capital R. And that distance is literally just the function x minus the axis of rotation, which is y equals 0. So that capital R is just x. Now the distance of the closer function, so x cubed, I'm going to call that little distance lowercase r. Lowercase r is the function x cubed that's closer to the axis of rotation minus the value of the axis of rotation, y equals 0. And so I just get x cubed. Now, how do I set up my integral? My cross sections here are going to be washers, or circles with a hole in the middle, or donuts, whatever you want to call them. Um, so I'm going to do volume equals uh, the area of a circle with a hole is simply pi big R squared minus little r squared, where the big R is the radius and little r is the smaller radius. Um, so I'm just adding up all of these circles. I definitely recommend going to the GeoGebra 3D calculator. Um, actually, you can probably Google cross sections, volume of uh, cross sections or volume of revolutions, GeoGebra, and you'll find some great tools uh, to really visualize these. But if you're watching this video, you hopefully already know these things by now. Um, that once you rotate this volume, this area T, um, and then you look at it from the side, um, and you take a cut, say right here, and you look at it from the side, you're going to see. A washer and that's a terribly drawn circle and it doesn't look like a circle it's gonna look something like that um, where again little r and big r so again what's the area we add up all the areas by integrating so we integrate from 0 to 1 because that's our lower and upper x bounds we go from 0 to 1 of big r squared minus little r squared so that's just squaring the x gives you x squared, squaring the x cubed gives you x to the 6. And because we are revolving over a horizontal line and we are only going to use the washer or disk method and not shell method, integral, um, integrating for finding volume across a horizontal line, horizontal line, you should be thinking dx, okay? Because we're not going to talk about shell method in this video. Um, I'm going to leave that to you. Even though it's a really easy one, you should get 1 third minus 1 seventh times pi, whatever that is. So 7 minus 3, 4 over 21 pi. Uh, double check that one. Uh, next one, we're going to take the same exact area, which again, this was y equals x cubed, and this was y equals x on the top and bottom. Um, but now it's going to go over the y-axis. So let's get out the green. We're going to take it over the y-axis. Um, since this y-axis is really x equals 0, I want to be thinking dy. I'm going over a vertical line. This is dy. Um, so now I want the right and the left, but I've got to rewrite these functions. Um, let's get out pink to really emphasize this. This function on the right, I want to rewrite as x equals the cube root of y. I need x as a function of y. That's going to be my capital R, my distance from that function to the axis of rotation is the cube root of y minus x equals 0. So it's literally just y to the 1 third or cube root. Uh, the next one, y equals x, well, that's an easy one to solve. You just get x equals y. That is the distance to the axis of rotation. Lowercase r is going to be y minus 0. Um, so I just get y. 
and I set up my integral the exact same way. Volume equals pi integral from, well, this one is misleading because I go from a lower y value of 0 to an upper y value of 1. So again, I'm plugging 0 and 1 into both of these functions, and it spits out, well, 0 and 1 respectively. Um, but I, those are different zeros and 1s than these zeros and 1s. Those are x, y, those are x values of 0 and 1. Uh, these ones are going to be y values. Just want to really emphasize that those are different zeros and ones. So I'm going to square my y to the one third, so that's going to be y to the two thirds, and then I'm going to square my y, that's going to be y squared. Um, again, I will leave this to you, but it is a pretty quick one that you can do. Now let's change it a little bit. Okay, so now we're going to go around y equals three. So we're taking this area, which went from x equals zero to x equals one. And it goes up to y equals 1. We're going to revolve it around y equals 3. Okay, not drawn to scale. That's okay. This is a horizontal line, so I'm thinking dx right away. So first things first, I want to know my distance from the function further away. Oops. Let's come back. Okay, this one is further away. That's going to give me my capital R. My capital R is the axis of rotation minus the function x cubed. You can actually, I'm going to write uh, quote equals x cubed minus 3. That is not actually true. But because we will end up squaring this, it doesn't matter what order you do. Um, same thing is going to happen down below. I guess I should say above. This function in green now is closer. It's our little r. Little r would be 3 minus x. Um, which again, you could get away with x minus 3 because you're going to square this because your volume is simply pi times the integral. x still goes from 0 to 1. And you're going to do big R squared. Um, let's do it maybe the true right way. 3 minus x cubed squared minus 3 minus x squared dx. So the main thing I want to point out here Make sure you square this polynomial. Make sure you square this polynomial. You should get three terms for each of those. Um, and then simplify everything before you actually do the integration. Don't forget to simplify and then integrate. Don't just start plugging in 1 and 0 and all that. So make sure you integrate. Um, how does it change if y equals negative 1? Well, y equals negative 1 is down here. Um, so now the green function is farther away. So it would be y uh, y equals x is the top one that's further away, so it'd be x minus, oops, x minus a negative one, so capital R would be x plus one. Uh, lowercase r would be now be the pink function is closer, so it's x cubed minus a negative one, uh, which is x cubed plus one. So now you should be in the driver's seat. Volume equals pi, integral from zero to one of, well, I'm just going to write capital R squared minus little r squared and let you fill in the details. So again, horizontal lines, you should be thinking dx. Um, let's just throw another one in there. Uh, let's, let's go big and bold. Let's just make a scary looking highlighter. If we took uh, problem 6 and changed it to x equals negative 2, well, all that would change is you would make minus negative 2. So you would end up adding 2 to both of the capital R and lowercase r. Um, and your functions would end up looking more like this, or I should say your integrands. So anyways, it can't really get that crazy. Oh, what well, do you know? X equals negative 1. I got it down here. Um, same thing again. So you rewrote, you had X equals the cube root of Y was further away, and X equals Y was closer to X equals negative 1. So your capital R would be cube root of Y minus a negative 1 lowercase r would be y minus a negative 1. So again, those would both become plus 1s, and your integral would look a lot like this. All right, let's move on. Let's do something else. What do you notice? I use the same function just because I want to emphasize that these are all so similar. Um, these are now cross-sections of a known solid. Um, so you're going to see this word. The region T is the base of a solid. For this solid, each cross-section perpendicular to the x-axis is a square. Find the volume of this solid. Ah, uh, there's my wife. Yeah, I'll head up soon. Uh, I might text her in a moment. So, 
what does it say? What are the keywords for me? Cross section perpendicular to the x axis is a square. Okay, so I do a rough sketch. Here is x, y equals x. Let's go a different color. Here is y equals x cubed. All right, and I think I want to copy this for another problem. Because we'll use it down here again. And why not? I'll copy it here again, even though I'm going to erase something subtly. You didn't see that. All right, so keyword, it said cross-section perpendicular to the x-axis. Well, the x-axis is right here. So what's perpendicular to that? Well, vertical lines. So what is the length of any one of those vertical lines? I'm going to call that length S, and I'm just going to draw one of them. And S is a terrible letter to use, but I use it anyway. What is S equal to? It's the top function minus the bottom function. I'm going to switch to gray. So that's the length of any line that I draw vertically, but connecting the pink to the green function. So that is now going to pop out of the page and be a square, all of those. And I'm going to add up all the areas of the squares. So what's the area of any one square? Well, it's that side length, x, s, as I called it, squared. Because the area of a square is just the side length squared. So what am I going to integrate? I'm going to integrate from the lower x value left on the left, x equals 0, to the upper x value on the right, 1. So I do the volume equals the integral from 0 to 1 of x minus x cubed squared dx. Uh, let's go ahead and maybe do this one. Uh, square that out, you get, so again, I'm just going to do the square part. You get x squared minus 2x to the fourth, because x times x cubed is x to the fourth. And then you have plus x to the sixth. So integrating that, I get 1 third x cubed minus 2 fifths x to the fifth, plus 1 seventh x to the seventh. And I first plug in 1, and then 0. 0 gives me nothing. 1 gives me the coefficients. So 1 third minus 2 fifths plus 1 seventh. I'll let you simplify that uh, with a GCF of whatever that is. Uh, next one. Now it says perpendicular to the y-axis. And it threw me a different word. So perpendicular to the y-axis, and it's a semicircle. Those are my keywords. So perpendicular to the y-axis means I'm drawing horizontal lines. So now I want to know the length of that line. So i got to go back. Uh, this is really x equals y. I know that's a subtle change. And this one is really x equals the cube root of y. So I've got to change everything. x is a function of y, since I need to find the length from left to right or right to left. So I'm going to take that right function, cube root of y, and I'm going to subtract the left function. So remember, it's always top minus bottom, or more positive minus the more negative one. Um, so right minus left in this case. That's going to be the length of that gray line. Let's call that length, I don't know, D seems like a really good letter. Because these are going to be semicircles. So you're going to have a semicircle popping out of the page. And this gives you the diameter. So what's the radius? Well, it's just the cubed root of y minus y over 2. I divide the diameter by 2. Uh, what's my area of a semicircle? Well, the area of a semicircle is half pi r squared. So what am I going to integrate? Well y goes from 0 up to 1. So again, deceiving, this is not the same 0 and 1 as here. Those were x values. These are 0 and 1 y values. The lowest y value where these two functions meet is 0. The highest y value where they meet is 1. Uh, maybe I should shade in this area to really emphasize that's my region T. OK, so my volume is going to be 1 half pi. That's just this part here that I can pull out the integral from y equals 0 to 1 of r squared. Uh, so root, sorry, cube root of y minus y over 2, quantity squared, dy. So if I square the 2 in the denominator, that becomes 4. So I get 1 8 pi, integral from 0 to 1. Uh, I'll go ahead and square that stuff out. I get y to the 2 thirds minus 2y to the 4 thirds. That's y to the 1 third times y. So that's 1 third plus 1 is 4 thirds. And then I have plus y squared dy. So you're going to have a 1 eighth, or a pi over 8 times y to the 2 third add 1. And you get 5 thirds. So you get 3 fifths y to the 5 thirds. 
Add one to four thirds, and you get seven thirds. So you get minus six sevenths y to the seven thirds plus one third y cubed. Plug in one, subtract what you get when you plug in zero. So you just get three fifths minus six sevenths plus a third, whatever that is, all times pi over eight. Um, next one, keywords. Perpendicular to the x-axis, equilateral triangle. Perpendicular to the x-axis is a vertical line. What is the length of that line? I'm going to call it s. Well, it's just the top function x minus the bottom function x cubed. What is the area of an equilateral triangle? Well, it is root 3 over 4 times the side length squared. I'll let you verify that or Google it. So then the volume x goes from a minimum value of 0 to a maximum value of 1 for this shaded region t. So then the volume is equal to root 3 over 4, integral from x equals 0 to 1, of s squared, or x minus x cubed squared. And you can really take the answer for our square from problem 10 and simply multiply by root 3 over 4. Uh, the last one, perpendicular to the y-axis. Um, so again, that shape looks something like this. This was x equals the cube root of y. This on the left was x equals y. So perpendicular to the y-axis is a blah, 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 blah. We'll read that in a second. So perpendicular to the y-axis is a horizontal line. Let's call that length, let's just call it L. Why not? L equals the cube root of y minus y. So that is the distance from the right function to the left function, right minus left. Let's read the problem. A rectangle whose height is three times its base length. Well, what I just computed was the base length. So what's the height? Well, the height is three times the length. So it's three times, and notice I'm not even gonna distribute. So what's the area? Well, the area of a rectangle is length times height, or base times height, or whatever you wanna call it. So it's really three times cube root of y minus y, and there's two of those, so squared. So what's my volume? Well, the lower y value is 0. The upper y value is 1. So integral of 3, I'm just pulling this 3 out. Integral from y equals 0 to 1 of cube root of y minus y all squared dy. Um, and that is really similar to this previous answer up here. Um, you could finagle that, just get rid of the pi over 8, and see how those answers kind of compare. So setting up is probably the most important part. So holy cow, we've been together now for 57 and a half minutes. That's 23 more minutes than when we last checked in together. I think it was 24 and a half is what I previously said. Please go verify that if you're really curious. Let's just fly through some USUB just to solidify all this, because why not? We're on a roll like Cottonelle. We were made for all of this wiping. Okay, what's the rule of USUB? You look at this and you say, can I integrate it? Or do I want to? And the first answer to both of those questions is no and no. I don't want to integrate this, and I, and I can't. Um, but I see something raised to the fourth. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call that something u. So u equals 4x squared minus 12x to the fourth. 12 minus 12x. Uh, then I'm going to compute du. du is the derivative of that, so 8x minus 12 times dx. Well, what do you know? 8x minus 12 dx, that's precisely du. So what do I have? I have the integral of too many color changes, u du. If I literally sub these things back in, I get right back to where I started. Integral of u with respect to u is just 1 half u squared. Don't forget your plus c. So I get 1 half, uh, ooh, a sliding, 1 half 4x squared minus 12x. I replace my u, and don't forget to add the c. Super, thanks for asking. Next one, I'm going to go a little quicker. I'll leave that one on the board so you can still see it. Of course, you could pause. You're on YouTube. Pause, pause, slow it down. Pause it and try it yourself before I do it. All right, this one I look at, I say, oh, can't do it, don't want to. So I'm going to do some use of make my life easy. I'm going to try whatever's in the exponent. So u equals 4y squared minus y. du is the derivative of that, 8y minus 1. Hey, 8y minus 1 dy, that's precisely du. So I have a 3 left over still. So I have 3 times the integral of u to u du. Hey, why'd you pull the 3 out? 3 is a constant. It's being multiplied. I can pull out any constant multiplier. Then I ask myself, what's the integral of e to the u? Well, it's just 
e to the u, of course, plus c. So I get for my answer 3e to the 4y squared minus y plus c. Hey, Mr. Spilling, how can I check my answer? Hey, I'm going to take the derivative of this. Derivative of an exponential, copy it down, times derivative of the exponent, 8y minus 1. Technically, times natural log of the base, just so you know the formula for that one. Well, natural log of e is 1, so you don't usually write that. Hey, that's my integrand. That's what I started with. Fantastic. I didn't mess up. Derivative of a constant is 0. Don't forget that. All right, moving on. Let's leave that in case you want that to marinate. Next one I look at, I see, oh, I got something in the denominator. Usually, whatever's in the denominator, I make u. u equals square root. Oh, hang on a second. Why would you do the square root? That's going to make it messy. What's the derivative of a square root? Well, it's 1 over 2 times that square root times the derivative of what's ever on the inside. Ah, nightmare. So what do you really do? You pick what's inside of the square root. Sometimes you take the square root, sometimes you don't. And this is a particular instance where I don't have another square root hanging out in the denominator. u equals 4 minus x squared, du equals negative 8x dx. Wait a minute, I've got the x dx, but I don't have the negative 8. What do I do? Well, I get out my red pen. Get out my permanent marker, right? Ooh, there's a joke there. And I also have to divide by negative 8, because if I multiply by negative 8, I've changed the problem. So I really multiply by a clever 1. Negative 8 over negative 8 is 1. So this negative 1 8 out front hangs around. And now I have the integral of du over root u, which is really, your brain should change this to u to the negative 1 half. So what do you get? You add 1 to negative 1 half, and you get a positive half. So you get u to the 1 half over a positive 1 half plus c. Divided by half is really multiplying by 2. Not really, but it's the same thing. And I get negative one-fourths u to the one-half, which is the square root of u. I'm replacing it now, plus c, because now you're masters, and then you get... Uh, Double-check your answer. Take the derivatives, you get negative one-fourth times one-half, one minus four x squared times derivative of the inside, which is a negative eight x. Well, negative eight x over this negative eight, the negatives all cancel, the eights are gone, and I just get x. Um, and this was to the one negative one half. I forgot to subtract one from the exponent. So I get negative x over. Oh, the negatives are gone. I get x over root one minus four x squared. Hey, that's what I started with. Super. Thanks for asking. Next one. Ooh, this looks like a nightmare. But I got something raised to the fourth. Something raised to the fourth probably should be my u. Uh, derivative of cosine is negative sine, but there's a negative already out front, so it's going to be positive sine of one minus x. But wait, there's more. Derivative of the inside. The 1 minus x is a negative, so it actually goes back to negative. Hey, now, I don't have a negative there. So I put a negative and a negative. Multiply the whole thing by negative 1 times negative 1, because now negative sine of 1x times dx is precisely my du. So I have the negative integral of u to the fourth du. So I get negative 1 fifth u to the fifth plus c. Make my replacement, negative 1 fifth times 2 minus cosine of 1 minus x, all to the fifth plus c. Uh, double check these. Type them into Wolfram Alpha, type them into Symbol Lab, Photomath, whatever you want. Next one, I see sine raised to the tenth. Uh, just a reminder, that is really sine of 3z to the tenth. That's how we shorthand that. Um, sometimes temptation is to say, oh, well, let's make sine to the tenth of 3z, the u, but then your du is hideous. It is 10 sine to the ninth of 3z times cosine of 3z times 3. And do you have nine extra co sines hanging around? No, you took 10 of them away. You don't have any signs left, so that would be a terrible decision. So we're going to make u just be, well, sine of 3z. So what is du? Well, it's 3 times cosine of 3z. That 3 out front comes from chain rule derivative of the inside. Do I have a 3 hanging around? No, I do not. So I put a 3, and I divide by 3. Multiply by 3 over 3 is really 1. Now I have 3 cosine of 3z and a dz. That is precisely my du. So I've got 1 third, the integral of sine to the tenth. That's u to the tenth. Du. So I get 1 third times 1 eleventh u to the eleventh. So I get 1 33rd u to the eleventh plus c, replace u, I get 1 33rd sine the 11th of 3z, I don't need these parentheses, but whatever, overkill, super, all right, now it's time for four problems that are really similar, but they're not the same at all, first one, I've got something in the denominator, odds are it's my u, 5y plus 4, du is going to be 5dy, I don't have a 5, I've got a 3, but I want it to be a 5, 
I'm going to sneak a 5 in. I'm going to pull that 3 out because it's a multiplier. I can. So since I snuck the 5 in as a multiplier, I also have to divide by 5. So I got 3 fifths the integral of 1 over u du. Or for some of you, 3 fifths du over u. And for some of you still, you need to write this as u to the negative 1. So your brain says, oh, I can't use power rule. My exponent is negative 1. Um, but you should know this like the back of your hand. That is natural log. Um, so you get 3 fifths natural log absolute value 5y plus 4 plus c. Next one, my temptation. Let's continue my temptation. It's to say that the denominator is my u. So then du equals 10y dy. I've got a y dy. That's nice. Uh, but I don't have the 10. So again, I'm going to pull the 3 out. I'm going to sneak a 10 and also divide by a 10. So I've got 3 tenths the integral of 1 over u du, which is 3 tenths natural log of u, which is 5y squared plus 4 plus c. All right, those two look pretty similar. Let's go to the next one. Oh, well, I got something squared in the denominator. Let's try that out as my u. Du is, oh, again, 10y dy. I don't have a 10, but I can pull the 3 out, multiply by a 10, and divide by a 10. So then I got 3 tenths the integral of u to the negative 2, because that u squared is in the bottom. Add 1 to the exponent, I get negative 1. Divide by it, I get negative 3 tenths over u, which is 5y squared plus 4 plus c. So again, the integral of that was negative, so it was 3 over 10 times u to the negative 2 plus 1. Negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. Also divide by negative 1. So I get negative 3 tenths u to the negative 1, which is really u on bottom. So that's why I get this. Let's kind of circle our answers. Again, symbol lab these, Wolfram Alpha, whatever you got to do. Next one, temptation. u equals 5y squared plus 4. du equals 10y. Wait a minute. I don't have any y's up top. Bad news, that's not the way to go. So you need to remember a formula. This should be looking like tangent, the inverse, arctan. But it's not quite right. You first have to factor out a 4 in the denominator because you've got to have a plus 1. So this is going to be 5 fourths y squared plus 1. Um, so now I'm going to pull the 3 fourths out. I got a 3 on top and a 4 in the denominator, so I got 1 over 5 fourths y squared plus 1 dy. Um, so I got to look at that first term. I got to think of it as something squared. Um, I'm actually going to erase. Uh, I'm not going to erase that yet. I didn't leave myself enough room to show all my steps. So then this is three fourths the integral of root five over two y quantity squared plus one. Okay, so that's actually what I've got to say is my u. I've got to say that u equals root five over two y. So then du is root 5 over 2 dy. Well, I don't have a root 5 over 2, so I'm going to sneak a root 5 over 2, which means I need to multiply by a 2 over root 5, or divide by root 5 over 2, which is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. Uh, so then my integral becomes 6 over 4 root 5, the integral of uh, du over u squared plus 1. And this thing right here, you've got to recognize as arctangent of u. Um, so I get 6 over 4 root 5 um, arctangent or tangent inverse of u, which was root 5 over 2y. And then, of course, plus c. Um, so notice that the first two were pretty darn similar. The second one was a little different because we had the denominator was squared. Uh, the next one looks so similar to really any of these, but it was actually a cleverly disguised um, arctangent. So be on the lookout for those. Uh, next one, these are pretty basics. Um, this should have a bracket around it. Um, got lazy, I guess. It's nice because they're both the same u's. You would technically split this into 1 and 2 integrals, um, but I don't have the time for that because now it's 944 on a Tuesday. So u equals 2t, du equals 2dt. Um, I don't have the 2 there, so I'm going to put a 2 and divide by 2. So multiply by 2 over 2 is 1. So I get 1 half the integral of e to the u plus secant of u tangent of u. And some of you are thinking, well, hey, isn't there another substitution? I don't know how to integrate secant and tangent. 
multiplied together? Well, you should because you should know the derivative of secant to secant tangent. And the derivative of e to the u is e to the u. So we just get 1 half e to the u plus secant of u. And then, of course, plus c. So that one is a very straightforward one that you should be able to do in your sleep. Um, it might look hard right now, but be sure to practice that. Uh, next one, you got all this stuff. And maybe your temptation is to say u is that, but there's, there's no power here, so don't get carried away. Um, let's try u equals cosine. Because what's the derivative of cosine? Well, it's sine, of course, with a negative. Um, and do I have a sign? Yeah, I sure do. It's right there. I just don't have the negative. Um, but I do have to be careful. I have to really split this into uh, kind of two integrals. This first part times the sign. So I'm going to write that. That's going to be, and again, I'm going to put a, I'm not going to put the negative. So I'm going to have sine of t, and I'm just going to write 4u cubed plus 6u squared to describe that first part. Uh, I'm, I'm going to write dt because I haven't changed it yet. And then I'm going to have minus 8 the integral sine of t dt. So that's me distributing the sine to this part. Okay. Um, so this first one then, right? I'm missing the negative that I wanted, so I multiply by a negative and also divide by a negative, which is effectively multiplying by a negative twice. So I have the negative integral of 4u cubed plus 6u squared du. And then this this other part that I have highlighted and underlined or whatever, integral of sine is cosine, um, is negative cosine, I should say. But because there's a negative out front, it'll become plus 8 cosine of t. Ooh, I was starting to write cosecant or something. Uh, plus c. Um, but I still have to deal with this part. So I integrate 4u cubed, and I get, well, u to the fourth. So I get negative u to the fourth u is cosine and then I get minus 6u cubed over 3 which is just 2u cubed so 2 cosine cubed cosine cubed t and then of course I bring down the 8 cosine of t and the plus c and now I'm starting to write bad because it's getting late wow we're cruising cruising for a bruising all right now we get to some interesting ones these may take us a little bit longer but probably not um, temptation may be to say, well, u equals the denominator, and actually you're not wrong, but it's really because you want to say u is what's on the inside of cosine. If you said u was cosine of root x, the derivative of cosine of root x would be negative sine root x times 1 over 2 root x, which is a mess because you don't have a sine hanging out. Um, so you do just want to say u is the root x, which I'm going to write as x to the 1 half. Uh, du is 1 half x to the negative 1 half dx. I'm writing it this way, but you should really be good with u equals root x, du equals 1 over 2 root x, uh, dx. Uh, you're missing the 2, so you got to divide by 2 and also multiply by 2. Um, so we get 2 integral cosine of u, du. Integral of cosine is sine, so I get 2 sine of u, sine was root x, and of course plus c. Um, again, take the derivative of this. Derivative of this would be 2 cosine root x times derivative of root x, which is 1 over 2 root x. The 2's cancel, and you get cosine root x over root x, which is precisely what we started with as our integrand. Uh, next one, temptation is to say u equals what's on the inside of the square root. And you're usually not wrong. Uh, du equals 2x dx. Well, I've got a 2x squared dx. But what if I rewrite this? Let's write this as 2x times x squared root x squared plus 1 dx. That's the original problem. Uh, do I have a... Ooh, I didn't want that. I want the highlighter. Do I have a 2x dx to become my du? I certainly do. But I have this pe pesky x squared that's going to hang around. So I've got the integral of x squared. Uh, square root of u is really just u to the 1 half du. So I have x's and u's. That doesn't work well. So I need to solve this u equals x squared plus 1. I solve it for x squared. I get x squared equals u minus 1. u minus 1 is going to replace this x squared. So I get the integral of u minus 1 times u to the 1 half du. Now I distribute my u to the 1 half. I get u times u to the 1 half is u to the 3 halves. And then times the negative 1 becomes just minus u to the 1 half. 
Now I integrate, so I get u to the 5 halves over 5 halves, so 2 fifths u to the 5 halves, minus add 1, I get 3 halves for the next exponent. Uh, divide by 3 halves, I get 2 thirds. And then of course plus c, so what do I really get? I get 2 fifths, um, I'm going to rewrite this, so to the 5 halves means x squared plus 1 to the 5th square rooted, minus 2 thirds, that's a 3, 2 thirds, u to the 3 halves will be x squared plus 1 to the 3 square rooted halves, and then of course plus c. So there's your answer written in the same form as the original problem. Uh, next one, your temptation may be u equals x ln of x. Well, the derivative of x ln of x requires product rule, and I bet I don't have that derivative hanging around. So what if I just say u equals x? Well, that'd be a waste of my time, because then i just change letters. So u should probably be the natural log of x. And conveniently, the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x dx, which I have precisely there as my du. So this is really the integral of 1 over u du. So it's 1 over ln of x. ln of x, I said, was u. Sorry to those of you that prefer I say natural log instead of ln, but whatever. So I get the natural log of the absolute value of u plus c. Well, u was ln of x, so I get the natural log of the absolute value of the natural log of x plus c. So that's a fun one. Double check. Take the derivative. Derivative of the natural log of something is, well, put the something natural log of x is the thing on the inside. Put the something on the bottom in the denominator. Put its derivative, 1 over x, on top. Well, this is equivalent to 1 over x natural log of x. That is the integrand we started with. We feel good. And we feel even better because there's only two problems left. Ooh, look at this one. Temptation. Temptation says make the bottom the denom the uh, u. What's the derivative of e to the 4t? Well, it's 4e to the 4t. Oh, but the top is e to the 2t, so that gets me nowhere. So you should be thinking, oh, well, isn't this really just e to the 2t over 1 plus, well, this is e to the 2t squared. All right, maybe this gets me somewhere. So then I say u equals e to the 2t. What's the derivative of that? It's 2e to the 2t. Well, I don't have the 2, but I can put the 2 and divide by the 2. So then do I have my du? I sure do. It's right there. So then I have 1 half the integral du over 1 plus u squared. There's our friend arctangent. Tangent inverse shows up again. So I get 1 half the tangent inverse of u, u to the 2t, plus c. So again, you've got to recognize that is arctangent. Ooh, speaking of arctangent, here's his buddy arc sine. Temptation says set the denominator equal to your u, but what's the derivative of the square root of 1 minus x squared? It's a mess. You don't want to do that. But what if I say u equals sine inverse of x? What's the derivative of sine inverse? I bet you don't remember, but it is conveniently exactly what is left over in the equation. Everything else is du. So this becomes the integral of u du, which is 1 half u squared plus c. So we get 1 half sine inverse of x squared plus c. And we say, are you picking up what I'm putting down? That was a wild ride of 1 hour, 18 minutes, and now 27 seconds. Thanks for watching. We did so much. Be proud of yourself. Take a break. Eat a candy bar or some really good food or something. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.